Chapter Ten, Part Two: Dangerous Labeling and Sense of Moral Standard. At around late four years old, I had the chance to visit my relatives in the U.S. for the summer vacation. At my aunt Hannah and Uncle Moshe's in New York, I strongly connected to Menachem, my cousin. We were like undistinguishable water drops, which is a Russian saying that. Uh, uh, we always stuck together. Uh, uh, played, f- uh, played, fooled around, and had the time of our lives. At least I'd like to speak for myself. Menachem liked to play video games, which I joined, and I just remember laughing to the extremes, falling to the floor, and holding my tummy as we were made. As we made fun of the characters we were playing with, or how incompetent I was in comparison to Menachem's skillfulness, the laugh and the laughing was contagious, full of merriment. Also, we had pillow fights, and I felt like a loved sister of his, even though we were cousins. Acknowledged and appreciated, I always dreamed of an older brother, and hoped. And hoped the tie would remain unbroken forever. Little did I know that the case would be starkly opposite of what I hoped for, and I just occupied an oblivious space later on in his lifetime. To be reminded, though, rules about us being together in one room were loose back then, because even though he was approximately twelve or thirteen, I was still well under the age of bat mitzvah, the age of maturity, which is twelve. This allowed us to spend precious time together. Around that period, we went to visit Uncle Willie in California, whom I adored. He was still with his first wife Bella at the time. Once Grandma Bella and I were sitting in a car. Bella told me to buckle up. I didn't want to because I felt that it restricted my freedom. Bella sternly forced me to buckle up, whether I wanted to or not, because she wasn't playing games with me. I had no choice. I submitted to her authority. All of a sudden, in came a girl in such surprise, as if she landed from the sky. She was the daughter of Bella's friend and happened to be the same age as me. She looked so alien-like to me. She had short blonde and red hair streaks and seemed to be so animated in nature. She started speaking to me vigorously, and I started listening in befallment, thinking, "Why do I not understand her?" At the time, I wasn't aware that there were more languages outside my frame of knowledge. I thought everybody spoke. Hebrew and Russian interchangeably, the languages I spoke. But listening to her, a sentence sounded like a long, tireless, multi-syllable uh, uh, word, as she was rarely catching in between breaths, which helped me know that the word was ending and a new one was coming up. However, she was uh, talking God knows what, and then stopping, waited for me to respond as energetically as her. I felt bad for not being able to respond, so I started forming my own words that sounded in the likeness of her accent, imitating those harsh vowels on rolling R's by propping. Up my tongue upwardly in the air, trying to reach the upper palate of my mouth, and then emitting a sound in that awkward position, which sounds like a dog barking. Ruff! Please, nobody take it too close to heart, because the Hebrew guttural sound is like a pig snorting, which means every language has its shtick, quirks, unique phonetics. Even if I ca-、uh, caught the accent, the words were formulated by me through my own wild imagination, by which I was conversing with her. Astoundingly, she responded in English back to me, so I figured I was saying something. Maybe I didn't know what it was I was saying, but she clearly did know what it was I had been talking about. Throughout all of our time together, we were bouncing a festival of sounds, words, ideas, which to me bore no meaning, but to her must have been overbearingly meaningful. Who knows? Otherwise, she wouldn't have responded. Bella and my grandma cracked up out of laughter. While being in Willie's house, I watched a movie with、uh, P.V.、Uh, a movie with P.V. Herman, of which the title of the movie I do not know. It was about how the hero P.V. of the movie got his precious bike stolen, and his relentless voyages in finding it. I watched the movie over and over again without understanding a word of what was said, laughing at what seemed absurd to me. 
Also, Willie loved to watch hockey in his room. I loved to be in his vicinity, and I always asked questions of what was happening, and Willie patiently answered me. Although hockey was not to my likeness, I loved to use that time to be cuddled together and felt comfortable and protected. I yearned for a father figure, and you gave it to me, at which circumstances was permissible by Grandma. On top of that, Willie was an amazing chess player. He would show me all kinds of crafty moves. Life is a, like a chess game. Your moves of life should be taught out, should be thought out ahead of time, as your greatest opponent, opponent, Satan, acts against the positive possibilities of life that you can gain by shifting your figures to conquer him. Another amusing memory that I had from being with Willie was when I sneaked into the car that was at the garbage, at the garage, that was at the garage, waiting for everybody to come in. I quietly took the garage remote controller as the garage itself was open. Willie took the place of the steering wheel and unsuspiciously started moving out of the driveway. But before we could come out of it, I pressed the remote control for it to start shutting. At the time, the garage doors did not have sophisticated sensors that would sense the presence of the car and prevent them from shutting. Therefore, while t to me it was jolly and fun, the garage door started closing in on the moving vehicle and Willie was taken by the ultimate surprise, got spooked and almost pooped out <laughs> as he started steering at the wheel like a ma maniac to get the car out of the driveway before we were crashed. <laughs> Thankfully, he made it, and he wondered what in the world had happened. And as he was wondering it, I started laughing from the depths of my lungs. Will, you should have seen yourself. You were just awesome, Darren Lee exclaimed while holding the remote control in victory. Will looked back at me from the car seat to the passenger seat where I sat and said in reproach as his eyebrows were pulled together into each other in a grave seriousness. Girl... We could have gotten killed or hurt by your games. Why? I asked in cluelessness, but with the most honest concern of innocence. The garage doors could have crashed into us and severely dented the car, he explained as his eyes were wide open in horror. After understanding the possible consequences of my actions with my limited childish mind, I lost all sense of amusement and felt responsible. The most amazing quality that Willie had that Grandma and Mom didn't is that even though I was mischievous to the point that it could have caused great repercussions, he didn't scream at me, only spoke sternly and explained my mistake. As I was about to start crying for feeling guilty, he said, Girl, it's okay, as long as you promise to never surprise me like that ever again. Without question, I did. Next time, I took my place in the car again and grabbed the remote control waiting. Willie, this time, sat in the car, checked if the remote control was in place, which it wasn't, and asked me if I had it. I said I did. He said that I should press it only when instructed, which I ob obediently did. The moral of the story is that I am obedient and I am docile and ready to listen to correction only if it is not deprecating and without ulterior motives, such as making myself feel small and oneself bigger. I appeal to common sense, to precautionary behavior, to advice that is heartfelt and sounds accurate and edifying. I am open to criticism as long as it is meant to be constructive and not demeaning. If it is said I am something negative, I check the source from who it is said by. Is it a person I value or respect? I ask the reason from them that would explain why they think I am so, even if it is a compliment. If the description is positive, I don't right away fall into believing it and fill myself with possible false confidence. I reflect on it as I ask them to back that up. If it is true, I retain the attitude that helped me earn this description. If it is not true, I work on myself to live up to this description. The point is that I always try to be honest with myself. If their insight about me is negative, I ask them to provide me with backup information of my behavior as well. If their explanation appeals to my common sense, I consult my conscience and start evaluating myself, dive deep within my consciousness to see 
if in fact I live up to the description they classified me being what? If I do, then I change myself or abstain from repeating the behavior that defines whatever negative description they had given me, and thus I better my character and grow spiritually. However, the description they said of me does not appeal to my conscience, and there is no sufficient backup information for me to see how I fit into this description. I invalidate their opinion and move on, but what I absolutely do not do is curse them out of out or make them feel small. They already have a small sense of ego and hurting them does not help the situation. Their urge to demean you is to make them feel bigger because truthfully they don't have a healthy image of themselves so they feel the need to deprecate others to get it. I consider this a personal problem that I should not intervene with. What really doesn't make sense to me is that when one is hostile and the other responds back with hostility, it's just amplifies the hostility and where is the joy in that i think what it is imp- what it is that's important is to not jump the gun and to hold your horses to refrain from impulsive conclusions do not start belittling them back to protect your own ego just because they think low of you nor take their statement personally and subject yourself to the mercy of hostility because hostility and animosity have no mercy. I rebel if it is meant to demean, not externally, not within the, uh, not with the people that have told me so because I can't change their mind. I am not going into a fight to prove to them that I am not what they said, but I rebel with the effect of the word internally, within my own head. Externally, I courteously nod and smile saying thank you for your opinion. It will be evaluated with great consideration and I try as hard as I can to abstain from thinking or feeling ill of them in fact on the contrary even if I if they misjudged me hurt me in any way I hold on to thinking of what I find valuable in them asking myself what I learn from them because it makes me uncomfortable to think that the friend